Every day we turn on the TV and there's more bad news. Another environmental catastrophe somewhere or more starving refugees or innocent victims in war zones. And most of us are busy trying to make ends meet in our own lives and we see these images and feel helpless to do anything about it. And I think the deep shame we feel about that is paralyzing, certainly one of the reasons that we turn away. The object of this documentary is to look at the flaws in our systems that allow these things to happen and the mechanisms that actually work against us and to show you a very simple but powerful way that we can actually change the world we live in. The material for this film is taken from facts available to the public and from interviews with some of today's leading thinkers. However, we do live in a world full of conspiracy theories and all I ask is that you keep an open mind but question everything. Because people have got to know whether or not their president's a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. Indeed, I did have a relationship with Miss Lewinsky. I think that gay marriage should be allowed. I do not believe that gay marriages should be legal. I am honored to be here with Barack Obama. So shame on you, Barack Obama. Iran, Cuba, Venezuela, these countries are tiny compared to the Soviet Union. They don't pose a serious threat to us. Iran is a great threat. We can end illegal immigration. We're never ever going to be able to totally control immigration. You have said in the past that it was, quote, pretty well confirmed. No, I never said that. Okay. I, I never think said that, that is... No, it's absolutely not. What I said was, uh, it's been pretty well confirmed. There are known knowns. There are things we know that we know. There are known unknowns. That is to say, there are things that we now know we don't know. But there are also unknown unknowns. There are things we do not know we don't know. One of the most important beliefs that people have about politicians is that politicians do whatever polls tell them to do. We hear a lot of complaint about the lack of strong leadership, that politicians find out what the public wants and then they pander to it, or at least they say they'll pander to it. Now what this idea of the poll-driven politician creates is the impression that the political system may have all kinds of problems, but on the whole, it's responsive and accountable to the public. So how do we explain this contradiction between the myth that politicians reflect the public and the reality that on most economic issues, they actually ignore public opinion. Media influence on public opinion has been studied for many years now. We know, for example, that the media often play what's called an agenda-setting role. Public concern about issues tends to follow media coverage of those issues, rather than any changes in the real world. The media create the impression that the American public has a real choice. You can choose Bush or you can choose Gore. The implication being that they're both very different. But on substantive budgetary or economic issues, the differences between them are really on the margins. Both leading Democrats and Republicans support a privatized health care system, they support corporate-backed global trade agreements, they support maintaining a Cold War defense budget, and they generally favor the interests of big business. But the media give the impression that Democrats and Republicans represent a broad range of opinion by focusing on civil liberty, non-monetary issues like gay rights or abortion, where Democrats and Republicans really do differ. And this masks the degree of elite consensus. There's a couple of completely logical reasons why our politicians are so similar. The end game for politicians is to get elected. The people who vote are, for the most part, quite moderate in their views. Both parties try to occupy that middle, moderate ground. They are simply responding to that majority in order to get elected. The second reason our politicians are so similar is much more sinister. They answer increasingly to the same master. Thank you so much. We're looking easily at the first billion dollar presidential election. It's much bigger money than we've ever seen in a presidential election. We define a candidate as being serious or not by how much money they can raise, not by what ideas they have, what their record in public service might have been. It's all about money. We really don't have an election anymore. We have an auction. And 
what's for sale? I mean, these are interesting questions to ask. Every incoming president rewards big donors with ambassadorships and other honorary appointments like that. There are all kinds of uh, policy issues. Is a big donor rewarded with a place on a federal advisory panel that might have something to do with, say, approving new drugs or environmental regulations? All of these questions about what's for sale. You know, is government for sale? Is the White House for sale? And I think a lot of Americans suspect that it is. The money flows in for a reason, and the reason is not good government. It is completely unrealistic to expect democracy to deliver representatives who will serve the people's interests when so much money is involved. Having so much money in politics gives all the power to those with money. Yes, we are all still allowed to vote, but how free is our choice? The media in the hands of big business will only present us with politicians that will serve their interests. It would be completely illogical for them to do otherwise. It would also be illogical to expect politicians to change a system that puts them in power. But it certainly begs the question, just what kind of democracy do we have? Do you want to live in a democratic society or do you want to live in the society we have? Uh, which, remember, is not a democratic society and is not intended to be. If you take a course in political theory here, I'm sure they'll teach you that the United States is not a democracy. It's what's called in the technical literature a polyarchy. A polyarchy is a system in which uh, power resides in the hands of those who Madison called the wealth of the nation, the responsible class of men, uh, and the rest of the population is fragmented. That's the way the country was founded. Throughout the history of the world, the rich and powerful have dominated it. And very few people have had any control of their own governments. But most real power in the world is still exercised by those we do not elect. We are still far from governing ourselves. The basis of democracy is the belief that we were all born equal and that that equality must be accepted by those in power. But in the attempts to win those rights, many people have been imprisoned and tortured by those who have power and were determined to retain it. No one in power really wants democracy because democracy will challenge their power structures and their authority. So anyone who comes out with a democratic idea is dismissed as unrepresentative or a troublemaker or an extremist or something. And in this way, the full flow of a public debate about alternatives is being extinguished. Big business is about making money. That's what big business does well. Governments, however, have to balance the needs of the whole society, including big business, based on ethics and social and moral responsibility. But if our corporations have become more powerful than our governments, then we have to understand the effect that is going to have on our systems. Corporations are artificial creations. You might say they're monsters trying to devour as much profit as possible uh, at anyone's expense. The 14th Amendment was passed at the end of the Civil War to give equal rights to black people. And what happens is the corporations come into court, and corporation lawyers are very clever, and they say, oh, you can't deprive a person of life, liberty, or property. We are a person. A corporation is a person. These are a special kind of persons which are designed by law to be concerned only for their stockholders and not, say, what are sometimes called their stakeholders, like the community or the workforce or whatever. I believe the mistake that a lot of people make when they think about corporations is they, th they think, you know, corporations are like us, they have feelings, they have politics, they have belief systems. They really only have one thing, the bottom line. All publicly traded corporations have been structured through a series of legal decisions to have a very disturbing characteristic. They are required by law to place the financial interests of their owners above everything else, even the public good. 
That's not a law of nature. That's a very specific decision, in fact, a judicial decision. Uh, so they're concerned only for the short-term profit of their stockholders who are very highly concentrated. So the pressure's on the corporation to deliver results now and to externalize any cost that this unwary or uncaring public will allow it to externalize. Towards the end of 1989, a great box of documents arrived at my office without any indication where they came from. And I opened them and um, found in it a complete set of Monsanto files, particularly a set of files dealing with toxicological testing of cows who've been given RBGH. BST, trade name Posilac, is being used in more than a quarter of the dairy herds in the United States, according to Monsanto. The milk has been drunk by a large portion of the American population since the Food and Drug Administration declared it safe for both cows and humans four years and ago. And at that time, Monsanto was saying, there's no evidence whatsoever of any ad adverse effects, we don't use antibiotics, and this clearly showed that they had lied through their teeth. The files described areas of chronic inflammation in the heart, lung, kidney, spleen, also reproductive effects, also a whole series of other problems. There's a cost to the cows. Uh, the cows get sicker when they're injected with RBGH. They're injected with antibiotics. We know that people are consuming antibiotics through their food. And we know that that's contributing to antibiotic resistant bacteria and diseases. And we know we're at a crisis when somebody can go into a hospital and get a staph infection and it can't be cured and they die. That's a crisis. Again and again, we have the problem that whether you obey the law or not is a matter whether it's cost effective. If the chance of getting caught and the penalty are less than it costs to comply, uh, people think of it as being just a business decision. Every living system of Earth is in decline. Every life support system of Earth is in decline. And these together constitute the biosphere the biosphere that supports and nurtures all of life, and not just our life, but perhaps 30 million other species. The typical company of the 20th century, extractive, wasteful, abusive, linear in all of its processes, taking from the earth, making, wasting. We're leaving a terrible legacy. Corporations have gone global. Regardless of whether the corporation can be trusted or cannot be trusted, governments today do not have over the corporations the power that they had and the leverage that they had 50 or 60 years ago. And that's a major change. So governments have become powerless compared to where they were before. Capitalism today commands the towering heights and has displaced politics and politicians as the new high priests. Corporations, by law, must increase their bottom line. In order to expand, they have to sell more products. Sell more products, they must consume more resources. Even going back 50 years, we could see the effect that this was having on our environment. Today, the effects of pollution and industrialization have multiplied tenfold, and the damage is terrifying. And yet these same corporations still want to drill for oil in the Arctic. And that's not just morally blind. That's morally bankrupt. Also, corporate expansion into other countries to get those resources is the cause of so much war and conflict, as you will see in this film. We need our corporations to bring us the technologies, many of which already exist, that can help us address the issues we face. And yet, the system encourages a thirst for short-term profit. I know many of us have heard stories about powerful groups of businessmen who pull the strings of governments from behind closed doors. And so many rumors have sprung up around organizations like the Bilderbergs and the Council on Foreign Relations that it's really difficult to know what to believe. However, it is an interesting fact. The Federal Reserve Bank of the United States is not actually owned by the government. It is owned by a private banking cartel. Now, whoever these men are that can loan money to governments have to be some of the most influential men in the world, and yet we don't know who they are. Not all conspiracy theories are just theories. 
And the research for this film pulled up some interesting quotes. Gold is valuable because it is relatively rare. Like gold, the value of money is determined by how much money is in circulation. One would think the power to regulate the money supply that controls our economy and affects our lives in every way would be in the hands of the government of the people. But surprisingly, it is not. The power to control the money supply is in the hands of the Federal Reserve Bank it is important to note the Federal Reserve is not a government organization. It is a private banking cartel. The Federal Reserve System is a banking cartel. Uh, it's no different than a banana cartel or an oil cartel or the sugar cartel. It just happens to be a banking cartel. Congress, in essence, has ceded total control of the value of our money to a secretive uh, central bank. It's a group of very large and powerful private banking interests. Congress knows nothing of the conversations, the plans, and the action taken in concert with other central banks. The government has given it a monopoly, a virtual monopoly, to create the nation's money supply. But all these actions uh, directed by the Federal Reserve alter the purchasing power of our money. This has significant consequences on our economy and our political stability. Wages never keep up with profits on Wall Street and the banks, thus sowing the seeds of class and discontent. It is bewildering to think that we allow an unelected and unregulated group of private bankers to wield such incredible influence over our society. The truth is that most of us will live from paycheck to paycheck in a continued state of struggle, unable to question a system of finance that keeps us on a constant treadmill. And while most of us struggle to stay ahead, billions of dollars in profits flow into the hands of private bankers at our expense. For this is how the system works. Whenever the government needs money, it requests it from the Federal Reserve. But the Fed doesn't just give the money to the government, it loans the money at interest. Every dollar the government loans from the Federal Reserve Bank has to be paid back with interest. This keeps the government, and as such the people, in a continual state of debt. All of our income taxes are paid back to the Federal Reserve to pay off the debt that the government incurs when it borrows money from the Federal Reserve Bank. This is all a matter of public record and easily verifiable should you care to look. The Founding Fathers of America were well aware of the perils of central banks and sought to prevent them. Several central banks were set up, but then removed. But the ruthless and powerful bankers, the Rockefellers, the Morgans, the Warburgs, the Rothschilds, were determined to set up a central banking system in America at any cost. In the early 1920s, J.P. Morgan, one of the most influential bankers of his day, caused massive panic in the markets by spreading rumours that many private banks were about to go bankrupt. This caused widespread panic. Everyone started withdrawing their deposits en masse and the banks had to call in all of their loans to try and survive. The hysteria destroyed the markets and the banking elites, having caused the panic, used it to influence politicians and the public that a central bank would bring stability to the system. At a secret meeting in 1910 at the estate of J.P. Morgan on Jekyll Island, the bankers wrote the Federal Reserve Act. They then gave their considerable financial and political support to Woodrow Wilson on the condition he would support the bill if elected. In 1913, Woodrow Wilson signed the bill into law. He later wrote in regret. The 
bankers made immediate moves to increase and consolidate their power. From 1921 to 1929, the banks drastically increased the money supply, making millions of loans. Then, in October 1929, having quietly exited the markets, they started calling in those loans, en masse. The hysteria that followed led to the Great Depression. The conspiring bankers bought up rival banks and massive corporations for pennies on the dollar. Their position of power and influence had become absolute. We get almost all of our information from the media. If we base our opinions on bad or biased information, then everything we believe is suspect. Political debate today is kept within very narrow boundaries, so the media can present both sides of these narrow positions and give the impression we have a free press. However, to talk about left or right wing press is to miss a very important point. Whatever message big business wants carried with whatever slant, the media will carry that story unfailingly. Well, the title is actually borrowed from uh, a book by Walter Lippmann, written back uh, around 1921, in which he described what he called the manufacture of consent as a revolution in the practice of democracy. What it amounts to is a technique of control. Uh, and he said this was useful and necessary because uh, the common interests, the general concerns of all people, elude the public. The public just isn't up to dealing with them. And they have to be the domain of what he called a specialized class. Uh, notice that that's the opposite of the standard view about democracy. Uh, there's a version of this expressed by the uh, highly respected moralist and theologian Reinhold Niebuhr, uh, who was very influential on contemporary policymakers. Uh, his view was that rationality belongs to the cool observer, but because of the stupidity of the average man, he follows not reason but faith. And this naive faith requires necessary illusion. The point is that in a military state or a feudal state or what we would nowadays call a totalitarian state, it doesn't much matter what people think because you've got a bludgeon over their head and you can control what they do. But when the state loses the bludgeon, when you can't control people by force, and when the voice of the people can be heard, you have this problem. Uh, it may make people so curious and so arrogant that they don't have the humility to submit to a civil rule, and therefore you have to control what people think. 100 years ago, Sigmund Freud, famous for giving us the science of psychological analysis, suggested that the ideal of individual freedom, central to the idea of democracy, was impossible. He said our hidden desires were too dangerous. Human beings could never be allowed to fully express themselves, that we must always be controlled and would thus always be discontent. Sigmund Freud's American nephew was Edward Bernays. Bernays is almost completely unknown today, but his influence on our society is possibly much greater than Freud. Bernays took the new science developed by his famous uncle and used it to manipulate the masses. Bernays is the man who invented the profession and the term public relations. He worked for most of the major corporations and advised politicians on how to win favour with the public. Like Freud, Bernays was convinced that humans were driven by irrational forces. But by stimulating our inner desires and then sating them with consumer products, he created a new way to manage the irrational behavior of the masses. What Eddie got from Freud was indeed this idea that there is a lot more going on in human decision making, not only among individuals, but even more importantly among groups, than this idea that information drives behavior. And so Eddie began to formulate this idea that you had to look at things that would play to people's irrational emotions. And you see, that moved Eddie immediately into a different category from other people in his field and most government officials and managers of the day who thought if you just hit people with all this 
factual information, they would look at that and say, oh, of course. There's a psychology of dress. Have you ever thought about it? How it can express your character? You all have interesting characters, but some of them are all hidden. I wonder why you all want to dress always the same, with the same hats and the same coats. I'm sure all of you are interesting and have wonderful things about you, but looking at you in the street, you all look so much the same. And that's why I'm talking to you about the psychology of dress. Try and express yourselves better in your... Eddie Bernays saw the way to sell product was not to sell it to your intellect that you ought to buy an automobile, but that you will feel better about it if you have this automobile. I think he originated that idea that they weren't just purchasing something, but they were engaging themselves emotionally or personally in, in, in the product or service. That it's not, you, you think you need a new piece of clothing, but you'll feel better with the piece of clothing. That was his contribution in a very real sense. We see it all over the place today, but I think he originated the idea of the emotional connect to a product or service. Democracy, to my father, was a wonderful concept, but I don't think he felt that all those publics out there would m had reliable judgment, uh, and that they, that they could that they very easily might vote for the wrong man or want the wrong thing, so that they had to be guided from above. You appeal to their desires and their unrecognized longings, that sort of thing. That you can tap into their deepest desires or their deepest fears and use that to your own purposes. Many influential thinkers came to believe that the public were incapable of making rational decisions and that as such, democracy could never work. Walter Lippmann, one of the most influential political writers at that time, argued that if people were in reality motivated by irrational forces, then what was needed was control by the elites to manage what he called the bewildered herd. And this could be accomplished by using psychological techniques to control the unconscious desires of the masses. Of figuring out how to understand how to apply those mechanisms to strategies for uh, social control. Democracy at its heart was about changing the relations of power that had governed the world for so long. And Bernays' concept of democracy was one of maintaining the relations of power, even if it meant that one needed to sort of stimulate the psychological lives of the public. So democracy is reduced from something which assumes an active citizenry to the idea of the public as passive consumers. Oh! driven primarily by instinctual or unconscious desires, and that if you can in fact trigger those needs and desires, you can get what you want from them. The corporations understood that to change our consumer culture from needs-based to desire-based purchasing, people must be trained to want new things, even before the old had been consumed. Bernays really is the guy within the United States more than anybody else who sort of brings to the table psychological theory as something that is an essential part of how, from the corporate side, of how we are going to appeal to the masses. He showed the corporations how they could make people want things they did not need by linking products to their unconscious desires. And the mass media would be the key. The media and marketing men spend billions of dollars in research. They have developed an entire science based on the very best psychology and knows exactly which one of our buttons to press to make us swallow an idea or buy a product. And they're not just selling us laundry detergent. They sell us everything from plastic gadgets to warfare. If we are to make decisions about the future of our society, the single most important thing we need is the truth. So I would like us to imagine a nightmare scenario, a powerful group of businessmen with access to the White House who control the media 
and who make obscene amounts of money whenever there's war. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. President Eisenhower's concern about the military-industrial complex, his words have unfortunately come true. He was worried that priorities are set by what benefits corporations as opposed to what benefits the country. Lockheed Martin and McDonnell Douglas and Boeing throughout America. There are factories, there are corporations that are involved on a daily basis. We have a snapshot in time after September 11th where at least 71 companies that we were able to identify are starting to get contracts to go in in Afghanistan and Iraq. All of the top 10 companies had former U.S. officials who had worked in the Pentagon or other parts of the U.S. government on their boards of directors. The Carlyle Group plays in industries and in an area um, that are heavily influenced by politics. My understanding is they are now the 11th or 12th largest defense contractor, a multi-billion dollar annual enterprise with an ex almost obscenely high profit margin. They hire defense experts like Frank Carlucci or Frank Finelli. They hire politicians like uh, George Bush Sr. or James Baker III. And the Iron Triangle is in some ways a uniquely American phenomenon. It's uh, the confluence of the military, um, big business, and politics. I will name as the next Secretary of Defense the best qualified man in America to carry on Cap's work, Frank Carlucci. When Frank Carlucci came on board, he was coming straight from the Pentagon as Secretary of Defense. A year, two years later, the Gulf War hit, and everybody knows that wartime is boom time for the defense industry, and Carlisle made a ton of money. They did very, very well. They really cleaned up. After that, Carlisle said, hey, you know, having these politicians on board is pretty great. I mean, they know things that nobody else knows. They are able to predict trends in global markets, um, predict trends in political uh, political shifts, um, and in some ways, and this is the sort of the most insidious part, and if you, if you want to be cynical about the Carlyle Group, you have to be concerned about their ability to influence uh, these trends and actually affect change in government policy, um, which would positively affect their investments. If you have uh, an organization that is able to operate behind the scenes without real accountability, and that same organization has the ability to ruin political careers for people who are a little bit too inquisitive or a little bit too honest, or to shape public thinking, then uh, we have the means for a kind of control globally that um, is probably unprecedented. So we, we have this problem here. This is a mysterious, immensely powerful company with virtually no scrutiny. On this February day, as this nation stands at the brink of battle, every American on some level must be contemplating the horrors of war. And yet this chamber is for the most part dreadfully silent. We have a Congress that failed in every way to ask the right questions, to hold the president to account. Our Congress failed us miserably, and that's because many in Congress are beholden to the military-industrial complex. When we're speaking of the United States of America and the concept of democratic representation, I think one of the more important aspects is the concept of informed consent of the people. If you're going to go to war, you lay out the reasons for the war, the justifications for the war, um, and then you subject it to debate, dialogue, discussion amongst the elected representatives of the people and indeed the people themselves. The defense budget is three quarters of a trillion dollars. Profits went up last year well over 25 percent. I guarantee you when war becomes that profitable, you're going to see more of it. We have a process that it has a seamlessness where the corporate interests that stand to benefit are so intertwined and interwoven with the political forces, that the financial elites and the political elites have become the same people. The attack came without warning, and according to a U.S. government source, told CBS News that it has Middle East terrorism written all over it. The attack in Oklahoma City appears to have a familiar mark. 
This was done with the attempt to inflict as many casualties as possible. That is a Middle Eastern trait. The fact that it was such a powerful bomb in Oklahoma City immediately drew investigators to consider deadly parallels that all have roots in the Middle East. ABC News has learned that the FBI has asked the U.S. military to provide up to 10 Arabic speakers to help in the investigation. The so-called independent media in a liberal society like this in effect are so lazy and are controlled by interests that are commercial and political at the same time that there, there is no investigative reporting. It's just basically repeating the line of the government. Only eight days ago, I concluded a broadcast on the World Trade Center bombing by telling you what senior U.S. law enforcement officials were telling us, that the threat of Muslim extremists operating within the United States is an ongoing danger, something we'll have to live with from now on and repeating the lines of the people who have the most influence, for whom Islam is a useful uh, foreign uh, demon to turn attention away from the inequities and problems in our own society. So as a result, the human side of the Islamic and, and especially the Arabic world are rarely to be found. Uh, and, and the net result is this vacancy on the one hand and these easy, almost automatic images of terror and violence. The situation in the popular media is, is basically that Muslims are really two things. One, they're villains of one sort, villains and fanatics. And B, many films end up with huge numbers of bodies, Muslim bodies strewn all over the place, the result of Arnold Schwarzenegger or Demi Moore, Chuck Norris, Lots of films about guerrillas going in to kill Muslim terrorists. So the, so the idea of Islam is something that, to be stamped out. It's easy to attract attention, and certainly the media's attention, for some of the political reasons that are obvious. I mean, to discredit the Arabs, to make them seem like a threat to the West, uh, to keep uh, the idea around at the end of the Cold War that you know, there are uh, foreign devils. Otherwise, what, what are we doing with this gigantic military? The war with Iraq gives us a snapshot in time where we can see the effects of all these powerful influences coming together. They have weapons of mass destruction. That is what this war was about. And Saddam Hussein possesses biological and chemical weapons. The fact that there are weapons there. You've heard the president say repeatedly that he has chemical and biological weapons. With the drumbeat for an attack on Iraq increasing, the Bush administration may finally have the ammunition they've been looking for. September 11th. September 11th. September 11th. September 11th. September 11th. Dangerous world. A grave new threat. There is no doubt that he is amassing them to use against our friends against our allies. A Hollywood set designer was brought in to create a $200,000 backdrop for official war briefings. In USA Today and in the major uh, network coverage and so forth, you had this very elaborate computer-generated graphic sort of coverage of the different uh, U.S. Air Force and Army uh, planes and gunships and helicopters and very snazzy weapons of all descriptions. Well, it's quite amazing. I, 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 I've, I've fallen almost in love with the F-18 Super Hornet because it's, it's quite a versatile plane. It's not enough for us to be told to accept this war. We're really encouraged to gain some kind of vicarious pleasure from it. The Pentagon for many years now, since Vietnam, has worked extremely hard at shaping news and how the media reports that news. We train people to say certain things in a certain way. Well, a militia group linked to terror being backed by Iran and setting up camp on America's doorstep. The propaganda campaign waged by the media was so successful that by 2003, opinion polls showed the vast majority of Americans believed Saddam Hussein was linked to 9-11. This claim was false. The majority believed he possessed stockpiles of weapons of mass destruction. This claim too was false. These claims allowed the corporate interests and the administration to frame the attack on Iraq as a justifiable act of self-defense. Lieutenant Colonel Karen Kwiatkowski worked at the Pentagon. She saw firsthand how the intelligence was distorted to win support for the attack. 
the information in there drawn from fact. You could find bits and pieces of fact throughout, but framed, articulated, crafted to convince someone of what? Well, of things that weren't true, things that weren't true. 911, Al-Qaeda related to Saddam Hussein, possibly some involvement there. The very things that a year later, President Bush himself denies and, and feigns his surprise. I don't know why everybody thinks that. We, we, we've had no evidence that Saddam Hussein was involved with the September the 11th. Well, I worked in a place where they concentrated on, on preparing this storyline and selling it. But what they're trying to do is have an Iraq that is a friend to us, not an Iraq that is liberated. That's, this is total bogus. We never intended to liberate the Iraqi people. We intended to liberate Iraq from Sodom and have a footprint, a military footprint there. And we've done that now. We have Kuwait, we have Fifth Fleet in Bahrain. We have a nice base in Qatar, but it's a little too far south. And what do we have? We have four bases in Iraq, beautiful bases. We can hit Syria, we can hit Iran, we can keep tabs on Afghanistan. There's all kinds of things we can do from those bases. The larger picture is being driven by the fact that we're about to hit peak oil worldwide that there's this sort of emerging global competition between us and China, there's the ongoing economic rivalries between us and Europe, and so the Southwest Asia becomes geopolitically a linchpin. The idea that uh, any of the motives that brought us in would have sufficed to get us in if there was no oil in Iraq does not persuade me. The pretext, that is the excuse for going in, in Afghanistan was about terrorism and Osama bin Laden. In Iraq, it's about weapons of mass destruction and Saddam Hussein. But in the end, neither one of those wars was really about those people or those regimes. It was about securing and solidifying American control over these incredibly important regions of the world. In this case, I was saying we've been lied into this as blatantly as we were lied into Vietnam. And I was saying that a year ago, that is in the fall, of 2002, at a time when we did not know that how much they were hyping the evidence or exaggerating the evidence for WMDs, for weapons of mass destruction. To say that in that world that uh, Saddam Hussein, after 10 years of sanctions and the Gulf War, was any threat at all was basically absurd. What you're saying is democracy doesn't matter in America, that this nation, the principles and values upon which we were built, simply is irrelevant. Uh, that the president is a dictator who can do anything he or she wants to do, um, regardless of the will of the people. No, informed consent of the people is a mandatory, not optional, but mandatory requirement on how we are governed and how those whom we elect to higher off office uh, operate in our name. They not only want to repeal, revoke virtually all of the progressive reforms of the New Deal and ever since and really bring us back into essentially unregulated, non-unionized country that existed before the New Deal. Uh, I think they want openly to see the president, given the power that he, he was delegated, as virtually a, an open, an undated blank check uh, by Congress that simply yields to the president. They clearly are trying to repeal that aspect of our Constitution, which gives Congress that, that authority which the founders uh, wrote in order, as a result of debate, in order to limit our going to war, to make it harder to go to war, to put that in the hands of hundreds of people instead of one man, they saw the alternative as the attribute of monarchy they most wanted to avoid. I don't think they, they take seriously any merits or advantages to a country of a Bill of Rights, uh, unless, it's the, uh, unless it's the right to bear arms. The, uh, but free speech, free assembly, free, I don't think they respect that at all. Freedom does not simply mean rallying oneself behind the flag here. This is a great flag. But freedom means allowing the kind of dissent and vigorous debate and tolerance of onerous points of view that people regard as obnoxious and hateful because we understand that once you say, I don't want to hear that point of view, you can't say that, you begin to stifle all kinds of points of view, begin to create a mindset. Freedom is a very delicate thing. It's a very delicate thing between limiting people's intellectual growth or not. And uh, that's why we have to be vigorous and extremely proud. If this flag means the Constitution of the United States, 
We as Americans should be very, very proud of that. And we should do everything that we can to fight those people uh, who, uh, for political reasons, uh, are trying to limit basic freedoms in America. It's this kind of ideology that has grown up in the wake of the Cold War, propounded quite openly by what we are calling neoconservatives in America, that identifies the United States as a colossus athwart the world, a new Rome, beyond good and evil. We no longer need friends. We don't need international law. Uh, like the old Roman phrase, it doesn't matter whether they love us or not so long as they fear us. I've been a born New Yorker all my life. I've lived here all my life. So for me, it was a powerful personal event. What I remember, what I think it taught, of course, my first reaction was fear, anger, rage, vengeance. I think all of us, if we're human, had that reaction. The question for all of us is what we remember and what we do with the memories. What is the lesson? What does it tell? What does it teach? For the president, it teaches the lesson the axis of evil. States like these and their terrorist allies constitute an axis of evil. It teaches the lesson that America has enemies, secret dangerous enemies who have to be taken out. Our enemy is a radical network of terrorists and every government that supports them. It teaches the lesson that we can never be weak. We have to flex our muscles at every turn. We will fight with the full force and might of the United States military. That's one kind of lesson. It creates a politics of fear. The politics of fear that this administration has deployed in trying to respond to terrorism has itself in some ways been much more dangerous than terrorism itself. And this administration has been, I think, responsible for inciting the very terror that it was the terrorist's purpose to incite in America. Calling it Code Orange Plus. The Fed's decision to raise the terror alert to high America on high alert from biggest cities to smallest towns. Red, yellow, orange. We're afraid. Be afraid. What level of fear? The government can program that without any justification. You know, we have an intelligence report. The terrorists are about to attack. Who? We don't know. Where? We don't know. What? We don't know. But you tell us, so now we're afraid. A Connecticut man wrapping his family's 19th century farmhouse with plastic sealing it in duct tape. States who sponsor ter terrorism. We're too great a nation to allow the evildoers to affect our soul. The decision was made within the administration to take this event, to take the struggle against Al-Qaeda, and make it into a full-fledged struggle against good and evil. Either you are with us, or you are with the terrorists. The important thing to remember here is one didn't have to put it in these terms. What didn't have to say, if you're not for us on our side, you're on the side of the terrorists. That was not a necessary response. That was a chosen response. The more we're afraid, the more you ask us to give. Patriot Act II, enhancements to the Patriot Act. Now the budget's starting to be bankrupted. Billions flowing out of this country into, into a war on terror. More defense expenditures. And therefore, I've asked Congress for a one-year increase of more than $48 billion for national defense, the largest increase in a generation. Perpetual war, the loss of civil liberties, uh, uh, the lack of trust in government because they don't tell the truth. These are outrageous and unpleasant political developments, but they don't necessarily spell the end of the United States. Financial bankruptcy does. Things that can't go on forever don't. What we're talking about right now is the rigged American economy can't go on forever, and it's not rocket science to say so. One war after another after another, we become a warfare state. That is, the, the uh, system is set up to go to war. We're going to find wars. We've already had two wars, two major wars, Iraq and Afghanistan. I think the people most without fear on September 12th in America were those working at Ground Zero. They were in the greatest danger, actually, but because they were active, they were engaged, the firemen, and the medical officials and the cops who were working there first to find victims, then to find remains and clear the site. They had a civic task. They were engaged and they weren't afraid of anything. American citizens after 9-11 said to the president, what can we do? What can we do to become engaged and take some responsibility? President Bush unfortunately said, go shopping. Go back to the mall. Go back to your normal lives. We'll take care of it. Spectatorship is an invitation to fear. 
Citizenship is how we fight the politics of fear. The politics of citizenship, the politics of engagement, taking responsibility is a much better way to deal with terrorism than hunkering down, being spectators, and allowing the government to rob us of our liberties. For anyone who doesn't yet know, our corporations have been in the Middle East trampling on their beliefs and customs since they discovered oil. Our corporations will tell us they are just getting us the things we need, and there is truth in that. But we have to decide what price we are willing to pay. We as individuals drive the demand for these resources. As long as we are all aware of the fact that there is blood in this oil, and that is the decision that we make, then so be it. It's completely understandable that people bury their heads in the sand. And if we don't look too closely, life doesn't seem too bad in many areas of the world. But that is going to change, and there are some logical outcomes to the way this system works that will affect every one of us. I was invited to Washington, D.C. to attend this meeting that was being put together by the National Security Agency called the Critical Thinking Consortium. I remember standing there in this room and looking over on one side of the room, and we had CIA, NSA, DIA, FBI, Customs, Secret Service. Uh, and then on the other side of the room, we had Coca-Cola, Mobile Oil, GTE, and Kodak. And I remember thinking, I am like in the epicenter of the intelligence industry right now. I mean, the line is not just blurring, it's just not there anymore. And to me, it, it spoke volumes as to how industry and government were consulting with each other and working with each other. The initial news report in the Army Times newspaper last month noted, in addition to emergency response, the force, quote, may be called upon to help with civil unrest and crowd control. Did this surprise you? It did. It surprised me also that NORTHCOM itself was involved in intelligence sharing with uh, local police officers in, in St. Paul. I mean, what in the world is NORTHCOM uh, doing uh, looking at what some of the protesters are involved in? And you had infiltration up there, too. But what we have going on in this country is we have infiltration and spying that goes on not only at the, uh, well, all the way from the campus police, practically, Amy, up to the Pentagon and the National Security Agency. We're becoming a police state here. Right now, as we talk. The Fourth and Sixth Amendments to the Constitution, to the Bill of Rights, are dead letters. Both of these bills were written into the Constitution by the Founding Fathers in order to protect the people of America from the government of America. Right now, the right to freedom of speech, the right to free assembly, and the right to a fair trial are no longer protected by law. The result of the Patriot Act, the Military Tribunal Act, and many other bills written in the name of Homeland Security is that almost any action, speech, or protest against the government can be construed legally as terrorism. Your home can be searched secretly without a warrant. You can be arrested with no charges revealed to you. You can be detained indefinitely and tortured without any protection under the law. In 2005, Congress passed the Real ID Act. Soon, we will be required to carry ID cards by law. There are plans to equip these cards with RFID tracking chips that will be able to track your every move. These tracking chips are already in all new passports. Many believe this will eventually lead to the implanted chip which is already being used in many places in our society. We have a Florida family who are really pioneers in a brave new world. They have volunteered to be the first ever to have microchip identification devices implanted into their body. After 9-11, I was really concerned um, with the security of my family. I wouldn't mind having something planted permanently in my arm that would identify me. It is not difficult to see a future where we are all locked in to a monitored control grid where every move and all transactions will be tracked, monitored and recorded. And if anyone gets out of line, they can just turn off their chip. Could the sense of fear and isolation prevalent in our society allow us to accept totalitarian measures of this nature? And if we become scared enough, might we not even demand them? Has our sense of fear and division 
detached us from reality. It is not too difficult to imagine that many of our fears are manufactured for us. History shows us that many in power have used fear to manipulate societies. And there are those who would benefit from a totalitarian world government. This is Aaron Rousseau, a former politician. Next to him is Nicholas Rockefeller of the Rockefeller banking family. After a long friendship, Aaron Rousseau eventually ended their relationship, appalled at what he had learned of the Rockefellers. So he said to me one night, he said that uh, there's going to be an event there, and out of that event, you're going to see, we're going to go into Afghanistan, so we run pipelines from the Caspian Sea, we're going to go into Iraq to take the oil and establish a base in the Middle East, and we're going to go into Venezuela and, and try and get, get rid of Chavez. And uh, the first two they've accomplished, Chavez they didn't accomplish, and uh, he said, you're going to see guys going into caves looking for <laughs> looking for people uh, that they're never going to find. You know, he's laughing about the fact that you have this war on terror. There's no real enemy. He's talking about how by having this war on terror, you can never win it. Because this is, this is an eternal war. And so you can always keep taking people's liberties away. And he said, how are you going to convince people that this war is real? He said, but the media. The media can convince everybody it's real. I mean... You know, it's just that you keep talking about things, you keep saying it over and over and over again, and eventually people believe this. You know, you created the Federal Reserve in 1913 through lies. You create 9-11, which is another lie. Through 9-11, you, then you're fighting a war on terror, and now all of a sudden you go into Iraq, which is another lie, and now they're gonna do Iran. You know, and it's so all one thing leading to another, leading to another, leading to another. Now, I would say, to him, why, what are you doing this for? What, what, what's the point of this thing? You have all the money in the world you ever want. You have all the power. I said, you know, you're hurting people. He said, it's not a good thing. And he would say, what do you care about the people for? Take care of yourself and you take care of your family. And then I said to him, what's the, what, what are the ultimate goals here? He said, the, the, goal, the ultimate goal is to get everybody in this world chipped with the, with the RFID chip and uh, have all money be on those chips and everything on those chips. And if anybody wants to protest what we do or violate what we want, we just turn off the chip. There are some very troubling possible futures for our society. Climate change will displace millions of people and will hit peak oil in 2015. Thereafter, the price of oil will skyrocket. So we'll see supply decrease and we'll see prices of basic foods and every basic commodity spiral upwards. Our current world population is just under 7 billion and that figure will double approximately every 35 years. So take a look at where you live. Try to imagine double the amount of people, twice the demand for resources, double the amount of pollution. Massive changes are coming whether we like it or not. I'm not a politician. I'm not looking for your vote, so I can give it to you straight. This system cannot continue. So who will make the decisions about who gets food to eat or who goes hungry or who gets water to drink and who goes without? Because the idea of allowing mindless corporations or wealthy elites to make decisions about population control is terrifying. The great heroes of our times, people like Gandhi and Martin Luther King, incredible though they were, could not create change on their own. Only the will of the people can do that, and together we can accomplish anything. Interestingly, the way to win back democracy, end the wars and save our environment has just one cure, and it's simple. We live in a capitalist system. Everything we do is based on the exchange of money. The media and the advertising men have turned us into obedient little consumers trying to buy ourselves to happiness in a throwaway society. This creates such a demand on our resources that our corporations invade other countries to get more, causing untold war and conflict. Then. 
using the wealth and power that we give them, corporations undermine democracy and justice. However, the unlikely and ironic outcome of consumerism is that it makes you, the consumer, all powerful. The way we use money has more influence in our society than anything else. And the way we choose to spend our money can change everything. No company will continue a practice or a product that you, the consumer, will not buy. It's vitally important that you understand this because this gives you ultimate power to change the world you live in. Companies are extremely sensitive about you buying their products because if you don't buy their stuff, they go out of business. That's not something any company is willing to consider. And by choosing to spend your money wisely, you can promote those companies that do business in a socially responsible way. Without saying a word, you will have sent a clear message that they simply cannot ignore. It will be heard, heeded and acted upon, guaranteed. This is real power. For example, if a company pollutes the environment or uses bad business practices, if you don't buy their stuff, they will change. If you don't want food with chemicals or GMOs in it, then don't buy it. Basic foods and cleaning products make up 70% of our weekly purchases. This drives the agriculture and chemical industries that have a massive effect on our environment. If we can start making the right choices about these simple everyday purchases, we can save our environment. We got into the habit of buying junk fast foods that have no actual food in them. We buy gallons of poisonous household cleaners when one degradable soft soap will do. We are poisoning our homes and wasting our hard-earned money for no good reason. Why? Because the advertising industry tells us to. They just want you to buy stuff. The car is the single biggest drain on the Earth's resources. Just about every mineral, every chemical and every metal known to man goes into the manufacture of our cars. The gasoline engine is inefficient and poisons our environment. The car, as it is today, cannot be sustained. It is up to us to drive the demand for clean, efficient vehicles. Do not underestimate the power of that dollar bill in your pocket. The way you spend that dollar already affects economies and lives around the world. Spent wisely, it can fix every problem known to man. The minute we start taking responsibility and spending our money wisely, Every politician, every corporation and leader around the world is going to know that we have woken up. And that is the most important point in this film. All of the abuse in our system happens because we just roll over and take it. But when we get involved and start making the right decisions, everything changes. Our consumer choices are the easiest way for us to get involved in a very meaningful and powerful way. But the issue is our involvement. You and I taking responsibility, you and I demanding the truth, learning the facts and making our decisions accordingly. There are serious decisions to be made about the future of our society. Because there are so many of us and population levels are rising all the time, we have to drastically reduce our demand for every consumer product. Breaking the habits of a lifetime won't be easy. Retooling industry and maintaining balance in our markets and economies is a massive undertaking. But we can address all of these questions. You have the power to deny profits to offending corporations and support those who maintain good practices. You can express the concerns you hold dear and herald a new beginning at every level of our society. This is the 21st century. If we use our resources wisely, there is no reason why anyone shouldn't have what they need. There's no reason whatsoever why people are still starving to death on our planet. And the common man or woman, whether they are Israeli or Palestinian, Protestant or Catholic or Iraqi or American, the common man just wants to live in peace and justice in a clean environment. When we look around the world and we see that that is not the case, we know that the will of the majority is not being listened to. That's the first sign that our system is broken. Government won't make these changes for us. Yet again, it is down to the common man.
Please don't just watch this movie and turn away. We can fix this system. Go to the website, take that first step towards an incredible future for all of us. Thank you for watching.